okay so I've started the recording and before we switch to the presentation layout what I'd like to do is to have everyone go to the chat pod and type the uh, state and county where you're located today so I just did that for New York I'm in Tompkins County Pete Nichols beat me to it Mass is scrolling faster than I can read. Ohio, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Indiana. Franklin, Maine. Tennessee. Virginia. Okay. Good. Looks like we have a good showing. Rhode Island. Hi, John. Georgia. Great. This is, uh, we, we do this for two reasons. One, to make sure that everyone's comfortable with the chat pod. The chat pod is what we'll use, what you will use when you have questions to share with the speakers. Um, and so this is a way to make sure everybody feels comfortable typing in the chat pod and gathers how the, how the chat pod works uh, so that when you do have a question, you, you know how to type that question in. The nice thing about the chat pods, uh, chat pod is that the question is recorded, everyone can see it, and if the speakers choose to delay the answer, they can always scroll back within the chat pod and, uh, and, read, and read your question. So you don't need to try and remember what your question is. You can go ahead and plug it in. Uh, my clock says we're actually at 12.02, so let's uh, jump over to the layout pod. And as this the, the presentation is coming up, I want to first offer my thanks to uh, Cornell University Cooperative Extension for providing us access to this technology and also um, uh, provide the start of a welcome to my speakers. Uh, Susan Stout and Alex Royo are uh, with the USDA Forest Service in the Northern Research Station Forestry Sciences Laboratory at Irvine, Pennsylvania. I have not met Alex before this uh, webinar. I've known Susan for several years and, and uh, have always been very impressed with the, uh, the caliber of work that comes out of that research station. So when I thought about deer and know they have uh, decades of experience from that research station working on deer and the impacts of deer on forests, I thought who better to to give a webinar on this topic. So with that, I'm going to uh, introduce, or with that introduction, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Alex and Susan. They will be doing a little bit of talking. Um, each one looks like Susan's going to start. And uh, the floor is yours, Susan. Go ahead. OK. Um, actually, Alex is going to do the early part of the presentation, but I just want to thank Peter for inviting us to participate and all of you for spending your lunch hour or noon hour anyway with us. Um, as Peter mentioned, our team here, our research team, has been working on the interactions of deer and forests for really more than eight decades, and that obviously doesn't, that means that people were working on it before Alex and I were born. Um, but so we have a lot to share. Most of our specific information will be from Pennsylvania research, but we have every reason to believe that the principles that we report apply much more broadly across forests, really around the world, but certainly throughout the eastern um, deciduous forest. And with that, I'll hand it over to Alex for the first several slides. All right. Good morning, group. So I'll begin with the talk uh, by providing a little bit of overview on the history of deer impacts uh, in eastern deciduous forests and then zeroing in on Pennsylvania specifically. Um, 
Throughout the talk, as Peter mentioned, there are several papers that we've uploaded to, to the Force Connect website. Uh, many of the slides will have citations at the bottom right hand corner and, and some of those citations are then found in that download pod and also on the Force Connect website. So if anybody's interested, <coughs> they can reference back to those. So the population of deer in eastern North America, as defined by McCabe and McCabe, really has undergone three different and distinct phases. The first of these is just simply titled the pre-settlement era. This I put down pre-1700, but off, you know, depending on patterns of settlement across North America, that age of 1700 can actually extend further into into the late into the 1800s or so. At this time, deer populations hovered around 8 to 20 deer per square mile. This is, you know, an estimate based on uh, archaeological digs of middens of Native American populations, based on uh, trading records, hunting records, etc. Um, and it's, it's fairly broad from 8 to 20. Oftentimes you'll see a figure that's narrower, about 10 to 12, which kind of falls in the midpoint there. At this point, deer populations were, were regulated essentially from the top down by hunting, as you see in this painting by Irvin Kaus, as well as predators. And they were also regulated from the bottom up from the available forage that was found across the, hab across the landscape. Um, early successional habitat created by fires, disturbances, tornadoes, etc. The next era is the exploitation era. Uh, McCabe defines it as a 50-year period beginning in 1850 through 1900. Again, those dates can shift forward and back depending on the pattern of settlement. But the bottom line is that throughout the entire range of deer, uh, from, a, from an estimated 20 to 30 million individuals, we were knocked back to an order of magnitude really to about three to five hundred thousand throughout the range. In fact, in many, many states and many counties, deer were locally extirpated, um, you know, hunted to n extinction. And it was in fact at this time that many states began reintroductions or restocking efforts, the precursors to what became game commissions or, or wildlife management agencies were initiated at this point. Um, state game lands were set up in places like Pennsylvania and these uh, deer herds had an opportunity then to rebound um, and they rebounded pretty well. If you, s if you look at this map here, this is white-tailed deer densities um, in, nor in the United States. And you can see that essentially east of the famed 100th meridian, um, anything in oranges, yellows, and reds is higher and higher and higher deer densities. Um, with greens being approximately that historic average of 10 to 12, less than 15 deer per square mile. These deer populations grew essentially because many of these game management agencies uh, protected deer from hunting, at least in the, the early years. They were also uh, afforded the benefit that the natural predators, wolves, coyotes, mountain lions, etc., had been hunted to extinction as well in these areas. And the other factor is that the forage available across much of this landscape was, was immense. Not only was it an exploitation of deer, but it was also an exploitation of timber resources. And so many of the, f of the forested areas were about, at the turn of the century, were uh, regenerating stands, essentially. The case in Pennsylvania, as we zero in where we've done all our, our work, is uh, essentially the same. See that at the turn of the century, estimated deer populations in deer per square mile was essentially zero. In fact, um, if you look back on the, uh, if you go to the Historical Society or the library and you can look at some newspapers from the era, it actually made the newspaper if somebody spotted a deer. I mean, it was it was a rarity. Um, Again, these were restocked from, from several states, New York, Wisconsin, I believe. The precursor to the Game Commission was established. Uh, they created these game reserves, which grew into the state game land systems. And again, given the protection from hunting, the, uh, the high amount of forage, and the absence of natural predators, these populations rebounded very well, exceeded the historical estimates, and remained high throughout much of the 20th century. Um, I've stopped the graph here at the turn of the 20th, 21st century. I'll show you the population trends uh, since then in a later slide. <coughs> 
Uh, how, nonetheless, this, uh, these high populations were recognized as a problem early on. You can see the, uh, that's a title of an article printed in the Pennsylvania Game News back in 1938 where they called deer a deer problem. Uh, even nowadays, this is uh, in the popular press and in the scientific literature, there's a paper from Bioscience written by Sharon Levy where they called it a plague of deer. And the issue is so contentious here in Pennsylvania that it's been termed the deer wars and it was a subject of a book uh, in 2006. So to overview what we're going to speak about today, uh, this is a slide that we'll keep referring back to throughout the talk, it's an, an outline. We'll talk first about the primary impacts that this overabundant herd has had on both the woody tree species community as well as the herbaceous community, many of the wildflowers and shrubs that we appreciate in our woods. We'll move from these primary impacts to uh, what I like to term, or we like to term the secondary and tertiary impacts, you know, beyond the direct consumptive effects, how have deer changed plant-plant competition, uh, small mammal uh, herbivory or granivory, etc. Um, we'll examine what the future of these browsed forests may be, and then Susan will jump in and, and tackle the final bullet there of how to assess if you have a deer, uh, deer problem and how to manage for that impact. As I just mentioned, the primary impacts are the ones that are most readily uh, observable. These are the direct consumptive effects. Deer eat plants, and so the impact of deer is on species composition, plant species composition, plant abundance, and plant growth. And in fact, over time, selective browsing on what we're terming preferred species, species, plant species that deer prefer to eat, will reduce species richness and shift species composition towards uh, plant species that are either unpreferred, deer don't like to eat them, or that are just simply browse resilient. And resilience in this case means that even if a plant species is browsed, that's, that plant species has the, the capability to withstand repeated bouts of browsing. And so in this simple diagram that I'm showing on the right hand side, you see that deer have a negative effect on many of our wildflowers, many of our forbs and shrubs. They have a negative direct impact on many of our desirable woody tree species, uh, commercial species and others. Um, and by reducing the abundance of, of many of those, they actually increase the abundance of browse tolerant species. And uh, I'll focus specifically on herbs, uh, specifically on hay scented fern. One can examine the impacts or even predict the impacts that overbrowsing will have on a forest community by knowing not just how many deer you have, but also what the, the, the traits, if you will, of the plants, resident plant species are. And so what I've listed in this figure here in this uh, table are many of the species that are common to northwest Pennsylvania to the Allegheny Plateau where we're, where we're working. Um, and these are you know, the, just initialed by their by their common name, and I'll, I'll say those in a second, as well as their preference, whether they're highly preferred, uh, moderately preferred, or low preference or not preferred at all by deer, and also what their resilience ranking is. Uh, low being they cannot withstand repeated bouts of browsing, and highly resilient meaning that they can get browsed and browsed and browsed, and they'll just stick around. So we have uh, red maple, sugar maple, cucumber, um, white ash, let me see if I can get an arrow here, um, maybe not. Yellow poplar, pin cherry, hemlock, rubus, the birches, black birch and yellow birch, American beech, striped maple, black cherry, got hay scented fern here, <coughs> and New York fern, as well as the grasses and sedges just lumped as a whole. And we can predict then a priori that in the face of overabundant herds, let's see here, The species that I've listed here in green are species that are, that are either highly preferred or low in resilience. And so these species tend to fade out or, or become less abundant across the landscape. Species in orange are moderately preferred, moderately resistant. They're the next tier, if you will. Um, and then the species in red, beech, striped maple, black cherry, the ferns and grasses and sedges, these are species that are either low on the preference scale, not eaten at all, or highly resilient, these are species that tend to increase across the landscape. And so knowing this, one can then uh, 
you know, predict what will happen in the face of herbivory and actually test it and, and observe it. Well, we've observed this in a number of different ways here in the lab, uh, both uh, with projects or, or that are comparative approaches and with manipulative experimental approaches. Um, one type of comparative approach is by looking at historic censuses versus contemporary censuses of plant communities. Um, we are lucky here in, in the lab and in the region to have had a couple great scientists that were working here in the early 1900s. Um, one of these, Lutz, which is down at the bottom right, published a, a very nice census of the flora of an old growth forest remnant called Hearts Content. Um, he set up a number of permanent plots and, and assessed what species were there back in 1928. And that's listed, you know, shown in the graph here on the light gray bar. Um, the Hearts Content Forest, by the way, has two separate consociations and associations, the more hemlock portion, the Hemlock Association, and one that's a mix of Hemlock and Beach, that's the Hemlock Beach Association. So that's what, that's what those two uh, sets of bars are. We returned in uh, 2000, as well as uh, Tom Rooney, uh, who's not at Wright State University, he, he censuses these in 95. So these have been censused twice since this historic uh, survey in t 1928. And in both cases, what we see is that over time, we have lost species from this forest remnant, from this old growth forest remnant. Um, putatively, the cause here is deer, although obviously there could be other mechanisms at play. Uh, but deer are hypothesized to be the primary driver. Another type of comparative approach, instead of having a, a survey through time or you know, in a, this snapshot through time, is to actually look at a snapshot in time. And again, here in the Allegheny Plateau, we find that there are many areas that have these large boulder outcroppings. Um, these, these essentially rock icebergs that have calved off the, the upper slopes and uh, presumably many of these are big enough and tall enough that they preclude access to deer so browsing on top of these boulders has been minimal if and perhaps zero over time and browsing on the forest floors proceeded as usual and just by walking up to these just as you see in the picture there is a lot of green stuff on top of the boulders and not a lot on the forest floor We've actually gone in and census these <coughs> to quantify what the, this difference is and uh, published a couple papers on it uh, that you can access on the, on the web there. Uh, if you look at the black bars, that's the uh, abundance of saplings on the left and the percent cover on the right of plant species. Uh, the black bars again are on, t on top of the boulders and the gray bars are on the forest floor. And so for black cherry, for hemlock, for red maple, striped maple, birch, all of these were more abundant on top of the boulder than on the forest floor. In fact, they were some of these species were absent on the forest floor. And specifically then on the right for forbs, many of these are wildflowers that we enjoy, and shrubs, uh, rubus, viburnum, etc. Um, the abundance in terms of percent cover, again, much greater on top of the boulders than on the forest floor. And so we're, we're seeing Again, that this hints that deer are driving this pattern, but, but we can't necessarily be sure. And so to really, to really address this, we need to manipulate or, or run experiments, and we've done those here as well. The most common type is manipulative studies that, are, that consist of exclosures, have areas that are fenced, presumably with zero impact, um, as compared to areas that are unfenced with ambient deer impact. There are dozens of these in the state, dozens of these uh, throughout the country, and probably hundreds of these types of studies across the world. And uh, wherever browsers are overabundant, you see what you see in this picture. When we're protected from herbivory, when plant communities are protected from herbivory, there's much greater abundance, much greater growth. Typically, there's greater diversity, etc. This is just data from one study we have in the lab. Uh, Dave Marquis, uh, back in the 70s, was working on this. Again, some of these papers are available uh, to download. And you see that at these three sites, Chapel Fork, Cherry Grove, and Silver Creek, the abundance of stems inside the fences, the white bars, was far greater than that in unfenced control plots. Oftentimes, this difference um, in abundance and, and growth 
makes the difference in, uh, in terms of uh, regeneration success following an overstory removal harvest. Um, and in fact, for much of the latter part of the century, uh, fencing was in, in many cases a requirement to ensure regeneration success following harvest, and we'll talk about that towards the end of the talk. Um, so those were exclosure approaches. You have zero deer inside a fence, and then you have some unknown ambient number of deer outside the fence. Clearly having zero deer is not an, a natural level. We, we've had deer across the continent, as I mentioned, 10 to 12 per square mile. So it would be interesting really to, to know or investigate what are the effects of deer at different densities. And to do this, the lab in 1979-1980 began a 10-year study at four different sites, so it was replicated, where they created a 160-acre uh, perimeter fence, and I'm showing you a, a schematic of one of the sites, Wildwood Tower. Uh, inside this 160-acre perimeter fence, they subdivided it into four different pens, one of which was 64 acres, and the other three were 32 acres. And then for 10 years, we kept known numbers of deer inside these different size pens, such that we mimicked uh, 10 deer per square mile when we had one deer inside of 64 acres. We mimicked 20 deer per square mile when we had one deer in half that uh, area, 32 acres. Uh, mimicked 40 deer per square mile and 80 deer per square mile. I should point out also that the, at the 80 deer per square mile, the stress on the deer was so high that we had uh, a fair amount of mortality. We would replace deer as they became weak, emaciated, or even died. So the average number of deer at this highest density uh, was more like 64 deer per square mile. Um, you can also note the different shadings on the figure. These represent different types of uh, overstory manipulations. 10% of each one of these pens was clear cut. 10% of the area was thinned. 60% was uncut. And these were designed to represent uh, the proportion of the landscape that would be in these different treatments under a 100 year rotation. In any event, we ran this for 10 years. And uh, what did we find? I'm only going to show you the data for the two extremes, the 10 deer per square mile and that 80 slash 64 deer per square mile treatments, um, just to, to simplify everything, and just for a couple different metrics. This is the number of pin cherry, uh, Prunus pensylvanica, above six feet tall over time. You see the, the x-axis is years after treatment. It was a 10-year study. Um, as we would expect, pin cherry is one of those species that's highly preferred in this region, and it's very low in its resilience. If it gets browsed, it tends to die. Um, and as we would expect, when we had high deer numbers, pin cherry was virtually absent from those particular stands. Where we had low deer numbers, 10 deer per square mile, pin cherry was present. In fact, it was abundant, and in some cases was so abundant that it, it uh, becomes an interfering species for other, for other regeneration. Let's stick with the same genus, Prunus, but let's look at one that has different traits. This is a black cherry, Prunus serotna. This is a species that is very low on the deer preference scale. <coughs> and so again, as we would expect, this species should increase over time. And in fact, if we look at the dashed line, which represents the highest deer density, 64 deer per square mile, it steadily marches um, up and up and up in abundance. Um, and so we're, we're seeing these shifts in, a, in, in composition uh, play out across these different deer densities. <laughs> Black cherry, Prunus serotina, in fact, was so abundant in some plots that, uh, as you can see in this figure, almost every single seedling that these technicians are censusing are Prunus serotina, black cherry. We, we had monocultures of cherry in some spots. It's not surprising then that if one looks at a metric like diversity, if many species are being greatly reduced in abundance and one or two species are becoming hyperabundant, diversity patterns should shift. And in fact, the Shannon index here tends to decline at the highest deer densities and tends to increase at the lowest deer densities as other species are uh, allowed to recruit in. Forgot to mention, uh, this, all of this work is published in Horsley et al. 2003, again, downloadable from the site. So these are the, what I've just covered then are just an overview of these primary impacts. Uh, deer eat plants, 
Some are reduced in abundance, some increase in diversity shifts. Um, when these shifts occur, they can then uh, precipitate these secondary and tertiary impacts, which I'll talk about next. One of these is uh, an indirect effect by which tolerant herbs or shrubs become abundant on the forest floor, forming essentially these monodominant or nearly monodominant carpets of vegetation on the forest floor. Um, and once this occurs, this monodominant layer, be it of beech or be it of fern, uh, can then exert a negative impact on the recruitment and growth of woody tree species, uh, primarily through competitive means. It shifts the plant-plant competition um, environment on the forest floor. This is data back from our, uh, from our enclosure study. Again, the same graph years after treatment. It's a 10-year study. This is cover of hay-scented fern. It's a plant that's not eaten by deer. And even if it were, it's highly resilient because it uh, it's spreads vegetatively and has a very robust underground rhizome. You can, in fact, you can weed whack it. Um, and it re-sprouts often in the same season. Again, as we would predict, being an unpreferred, highly resilient species, it went from about 2 to 5 percent ground cover at the start of the experiment to nearly 40 percent ground cover by year 10 in the highest deer density treatment. And this has occurred throughout much of the national forest, in fact throughout much of Pennsylvania and beyond in the Northeast, where you see these uh, impenetrable carpets of hay scented fern as far as the eye can see. Um, and we have some work to document not only hay scented fern uh, having this pattern, but also a review of other plant species that do this throughout the world, again on that paper on the bottom right. Uh, fern cover can decrease seedling recruitment through a number of means, but Horsley, uh, through a suite of very nice studies, found that the primary mechanism of interference was competition for light. And so on this graph what we're showing is survival of four different tree species um, across two years and you can see that beneath fern, the dark green bar, uh, the survival of many of these is far far less underneath fern than in open areas, areas without fern. Again, the primary mechanism was believed to be light. In addition to light competition, however, uh, we've also tested an alternative hypothesis or, or an additional hypothesis that once deer facilitate the expansion of these browse tolerant uh, monodominant carpets of vegetation, fern in this case, this altered habitat essentially is then preferred by small mammals like mice, chipmunks, uh, squirrels, etc. who prefer to forage or, or just uh, hang out underneath this dense carpet of fern than in open areas because they sense that they're protected from aerial predators. If in fact this is true and you have higher usage and foraging beneath fern, um, you then have this setup where you have this indirect effect by which fern increases small mammal activity and predation on uh, woody tree seeds and seedlings. We tested this through uh, an experiment where we manipulated both fern cover, present versus absent, and uh, access by small mammals, present versus absent, using these fences that you can appreciate in the slide. Um, and this really allows us to test, is any effect we see on fern, ex excuse me, is any effect we see on seedling establishment, survival, and growth due simply to fern cover, light? Is it simply due to predation? or is it really the synergy between the two? Just presenting a couple slides of some of the data from this experiment, again uploaded to the web. Uh, our fences, our exclosures for small mammals worked fairly well. You see on the left hand side we caught very few critters underneath or within the fences. Um, some did manage to get in. Um, and then more importantly in areas that were unfenced, that is areas that had access to s that small mammals had access to them, we caught more than twice as many uh, small mammals in fern covered areas than we did in open uh, you know, no fern areas. Um, and so this confirms part one of the hypothesis. Now the question is do we see the inverse pattern for plant recruitment? Um, do we see the lowest number of seedlings uh, at the very far right, areas that have both predation and fern cover? And here's the data for black cherry recruitment, uh, seedling density. We had the highest number of seedlings found inside fences, you know, where there was no predation. Um, 
and you do see that there is a synergy between fern cover, so that light effect, and also that predation effect, um, seed predation, such that the lowest number of seedlings are found in areas where there is both fern and small mammal predation. And so fern cover really is exerting at least two different impacts or negative impacts on, on seedling recruitment. And so just to overview these effects we, uh, on vegetation, we, you know, we have these primary effects, these direct consumptive effects. We have these uh, secondary effects, which, by which I'm referring to this uh, altered plant-plant uh, competition where dense carpets of fern or other uh, tolerant browse, browse tolerant species can outcompete uh, regeneration. And we have the tertiary impacts whereby these carpets of vegetation facilitate increased seed predation by small mammals and seedling predation. There are, of course, other impacts the, uh, that, that we have not mentioned here. Uh, for example, deer can alter vegetation and structure so much that bird communities can change in areas with high deer numbers and low deer numbers. We have work from that here, from that deer enclosure study. Uh, there's work in uh, Virginia by McShay and Bill Healy's done some work in Massachusetts on, on how this change in forest structure can alter uh, patterns of, of avian communities use. Um, we also have new work here that we've started with a collaborator by which changes in species diversity, right, so if deer have overbrowsed a forest and caused a, a, a restriction in species richness, that can then have a cascading effect on the, on the insect species that use these trees, which then cascades up towards the bird communities that eat, feed on these insects. This, this kind of cascade or chain of events. So what happens to these browse legacy forests now that you know, we've had 70, 80 years of overbrowsing? You know, forests that look like this picture, where we have a nice mature canopy, 80 plus years old, absolutely no secondary structure, no saplings or pole-sized trees, and then a dense carpet of fern or some other interfering plant species. One way we're, we're assessing this is through a project we're calling the Kinzu Quality Deer Cooperative, that's the KQDC there. What we've done in this, or what we're continuing to do in this project, is uh, manage a 74,000 acre area here in northwest Pennsylvania, which is a partnership uh, between public and private landowners. It's this area that's in red there on the, within the boundaries of the Allegheny National Forest. That area in red has been expanded here. What we're, what we're doing here is uh, intense vegetation sampling in as many as 147 unmanaged forest stands. It's important to keep this unmanaged in mind. Um, we conduct deer density estimates in these areas, uh, in, these, in square mile blocks, uh, using deer pellet group counts and we also have these vegetation monitoring surveys and the goal is to assess forest community response, the vegetation response, to reductions of deer herd across the landscape. Now uh, we've reduced the deer herd aggressively primarily through the use of the deer management and assistance program with cooperation of the Pennsylvania Game Commission. Essentially we we issue out additional doe tags and uh, you know concentrate hunting within the KQDC. We've tried to increase hunter awareness through incentives such as banquets in the, in the winter and outreach. We, we hand out maps of where we believe the highest concentrations of deer are given our pellet group surveys. We increase road access, we open gates, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially doing everything we can to focus hunting within these 74,000 acres. And has it worked? Well, indeed it has. I've expanded now the deer density uh, population estimates or, well, estimates, not really, they're actually known counts and, um, through 2007. And you could see that DMAP beginning in 03 has had a significant effect and has cut deer numbers in half, where now within the KQDC we're hovering at around 10 to 12 deer per square mile. Have the plants communities responded? Um, one way to assess this is to look at some certain herbaceous plants that have been identified as very sensitive indicators of deer browsing. Things like uh, Canada Mayflower on the upper left, um, Indian Cucumber on the upper right, and Trillium, which is the poster child of, uh, of indicator plants. Many of these are, are citations here talk about these indicator species. 
Well, in fact, many of these have responded positively. If you see cover of Canada Mayflower, um, it's more than doubled beginning, you know, following 2003 when these aggressive deer herd reductions began. Indian cucumber root height, which is one of the indicators that we use uh, for this species, has increased significantly as well. Trillium has uh, had a significant increase in height, approximately 50% or so, and uh, percent flowering of trillium has more than doubled. So, uh, so these sensitive indicators are telling us then that our reductions in deer herd numbers across the 74,000 acres are having a positive impact on these metrics. How about uh, the plant community as a whole? Um, across the 74,000 acres in, in our 147 stands, we've documented over 250 plant species, which sounds great at first pass, but many of these plant species were just found once or twice in one or two stands. And in fact, most of what we found are species, quote unquote, in red, species that are browse tolerant or not browsed at all. Um, two-thirds of these are ferns, hay-scented fern, New York fern, and uh, wood fern. And the next two, so numbers four and five on the relative abundance scale, are uh, club mosses. So yes, we have a lot of species, but most of them are, are very uh, low in abundance, and the forests, in fact, are shifted dramatically towards uh, these browse-tolerant plants. How about the regeneration, right? A lot of this is driven by our need to reduce fencing across the landscape um, and ensure that we have forests following forests. We have a number of plant species here. Uh, at Acer pensylvanicum is uh, striped maple, Acer rubrum, red maple, sugar maple, the birches as a whole, white ash, beech, and uh, black cherry. That's what the species are across the x-axis. And what I'm showing here is the density of seedlings that are greater than a foot, but less than or equal to five feet. Um, and what we see here, again, the three bars being 2001, 2003, and 2007, um, is that really no species have increased in density significantly over time, except for beech, which again is a fairly low, pref pr uh, a fairly resilient species that's low on the preference scale for deer. Obviously, it's also highly shade tolerant species, so in these unmanaged forests, we would expect a shade tolerant species to increase in abundance over time. And this is also confounded in part by the fact that we do have beech bark disease in the region, and oftentimes that stress of mortality for the overstory tree triggers suckering by the beech. So that, that part there is confounded a bit. If we look at overall richness and diversity, um, again, we've brought deer numbers down and kept them low for four or five years now. It's essentially flatlined. Richness has not moved at all, as has diversity. Um, so these are, in fact, browse legacy forests that are resistant to recovery in unmanaged stands. And so it will take some type of management action to, to promote, or to maintain, or in fa even promote diversity in these stands. Um, and then some of this is what my colleague then, Susan Stout, will be talking about over the next few slides. Thank you. So I'm going to take up the topic of how we've tried to translate all this decades of research into tools that managers can use to sustain diversity where um, they have the good fortune to have retained it and to manage deer impact where they haven't. And I'm going to go back a little bit to the exclosure study that Alex talked about at some length. And what I'm showing here are two photographs taken in the 10th year of the study of clear cuts at two of the study sites. The study site at the it's actually one study site, two different deer densities. The photo at the top shows the age 10 clear cut um, in the 10 deer per square mile subset of this enclosure. And the photo at the bottom shows the um, 
clear cut in the 64 deer per square mile exposure. And while you can certainly see a stark difference there, you can also see that there is a forest developing even at 64 deer per square mile. And prior to conducting this study, we had actually chosen that high deer density because we had evidence from some of our exclosures that we could anticipate really complete failure to replace forest by forest at that high end. So why did we have an average across the four study sites using even the most stringent standards for young forest stocking, we still averaged 50% stocking in those high deer density um, clear cuts. And why would that be? Now, I was actually not at the lab when they began to wrestle with this issue, but some of the great minds of forestry and deer management in Pennsylvania spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out why were there any seedlings at all in those high deer density clear cuts. The answer turned out to be a function of the study design. In our study, as Alex told you, each enclosure had 10% um, clear cutting and 30% thinning. And the idea was specifically to create a certain amount of forage on the landscape to give the starting conditions for these different numbers of deer in terms of forage ability, in, in terms of forage supply, um, from a uniform starting point. And so, and we used the model of a 100-year rotation, perfectly balanced forest. Outside the fences, however, we had already provided guidelines to managers suggesting that they should only conduct final harvests where they had abundant advanced regeneration already in place, something that was quite difficult to find given the high ambient deer densities. And so the conclusion that we arrived at was that on some level we were asking the wrong question. We thought we were trying that the thing we really needed to know was how many deer were too many. And what we recognized at the midpoint of the study was that we needed to identify the level of deer impact that was too high. Now, what do I mean by deer impact? This is a graph that Dave Marquis came up with to capture the fact that the impact deer have on a given landscape is a function not only of how many deer there are on that landscape, but also of how much food that landscape is providing for deer. And so, um, if you look, for example, at approximately 30 deer per square mile in a landscape, and you could get to this high deer food condition in a variety of ways. It might be a landscape where forest and farmland or forest and landscape um, exurbia were intermingled so that there was lots of food on the ground for deer. It might be in a deep interior forest where um, the landscape was um, interspersed with a lot of silvicultural activity as our study area was. But if you keep that same number of deer per square mile and go up to a condition such as you might find if you're doing just one harvest in the middle of a huge otherwise intact forest, the deer will have much more impact on the um, seedlings that pop up and herbaceous plants that pop up in that low deer food landscape even though the number of deer remain the same. And so what we suggest first and foremost to managers is that they think in terms of deer impact when they think about what do I need to measure to find out what I need to do to sustain biodiversity and successful regeneration on my landscape. And so um, 
here are some ways to identify on the landscape what your deer impact situation is. You can use the indicator plants that Alex has already talked about. Almost all of these have been verified really across the northeastern deciduous forests. There's a lot of literature on these from Wisconsin, for example. There's literature in Illinois. There's literature here in Pennsylvania. And these are fairly common plants. So when you see high proportions of flowering in these plants, large individual plant size, um, flowers lasting long enough to turn into fruits and you find those in your landscape then you can be reasonably confident you're at a low level of deer impact. Another key way to recognize low deer impact is to look at the variation in seedling height and shrub height um, on the uh, on the landscape so that where if these are again results from our deer enclosure and you can recognize that at the low deer densities 10 and 20 deer per square mile not only are the height the mean heights taller but look at the range of height and what that really means is that the plants are able to respond to variation in light across the forest floor and when you get up to 64 deer per square mile it's really deer that are determining um, how tall the plants are and so there's very little variation in height because basically the plants are as tall as the deer allow them to be so that's another thing uh, that you can look at in your forest to recognize what the deer impact might be um, one of the things that we learned from this and other studies was that there is such a thing as deer impact that is too low. This is really a reaffirmation of something that on a gut level we all know that deer are a natural part of this ecosystem and one of the roles that they have obviously played historically is limiting the abundance of their favorite species so that they are um, it interferes with the way they compete. So in our very low deer density pens, pin cherry, which is highly preferred by deer, became so dense and it grows tall so fast that it actually interfered with the development of diversity and with other species. Um, to recognize moderate deer impact, it's nice if you have some areas w that have already been harvested because stump sprouts are a marvelous indicator. And often deer will s walk through a forest looking for stump sprouts because since they're tapped into a big root system, they are actually more nutritious than true seedlings. And so um, getting getting a good look at stump sprouts and how heavily browsed they are, getting a sense of what your most preferred species are, to take a good look at browsing pressure on those, and then becoming aware of what are the unpalatable or browse resistant species in your landscape and are they becoming more common on the forest floor and that would help you recognize again that you're at a moderate level of deer impact. The clues for high deer impacts will come as no surprise to those of you who have ever seen them. Um, regeneration will be sparse, it will be of a uniform height, it will be dominated by plants that are less preferred by deer. The trick with high deer impacts, as we're learning here on the plateau, is that it's especially difficult to identify whether you're in a forest that has this, these conditions because of a historical condition, these legacy effects that Alex talked about. If you get an understory of fern, like the one shown in the lower right, in place, um, it, can, it can hold its own even when deer density comes down. And that was really what, what Alex was talking about at the end of his slides, that we're going to have to manage the legacy effects as well as the deer. Um, and finally, we all know that the more distinct the brow line is, the greater the deer impact. Um, and if you get into this situation, you really are in big deer trouble. Um, in terms of how you use this information in management, 
Um, I can say that for oak forests in particular, there's a very strong consensus in Pennsylvania that oak just simply won't regenerate, especially on mesic and high quality sites when deer impact is high or very high. And our recommendation and the practice here has been that when deer impact is high or very high, fencing is required for regeneration treatments unless you happen to have an unpreferred species that meets your management objectives. So for a period of time at moderately high levels of deer impact, people on the Allegheny Plateau were able to regenerate some stands of black cherry without a fence um, where that was their, um, that met their objectives. Um, in terms of Okay, so I recognize that I'm in a situation where I need to manage deer impact. And are there, do I have any other tools besides um, fencing to use for this management? I take you back to this deer impact graph and remind you that you can affect deer impact both by the way you manage habitat quality and by the way you work with others to manage deer density. So let's talk about both of those tracks. How can an individual forest manager or landowner um, help deer manage deer density? Obviously, you have to work with the regulations of your state. Um, and I certainly urge you to take advantage of any special land management tag programs that your state has available. But you really need to think about things like engaging hunters and um, managing the uh, rewarding them for what they do, managing the conditions in which they hunt. And so the underlying principle here is that, at least in Pennsylvania, hunters and landowners were really at odds through much of the 20th century, and they allowed the game agency to arbitrate their conflicting needs, whereas in reality, Land and resource managers and hunters are interdependent. Hunters really need land and resource managers to provide quality habitat for deer and obviously to give them access for hunting. And land and resource managers will find that there is no um, less expensive tool for managing deer impact than engaging hunters and bringing them onto the landscape. And so thinking about that relationship proactively can actually help you manage deer impact. People around here have also developed a whole series of landscape strategies for making hunting success easier. Keeping log roads open allows hunters easier access deep into your property. It can allow you to, um, you can actually uh, grow some food, low growing food in the um, log roads and uh, you actually need to remind people to be careful there. You can manage visibility. We have a landowner colleague who lets hunters know where um, herbicide treatments have been applied to the forest understory because that increases hunter visibility. Um, you can also leave corridors for wildlife to move through and let, hu let hunters know where those are. And of course, there's fencing. You can fence individual seedlings. There's been a fair amount of research that says that those strategies are more effective in high light than they are in partial shade. And you can fence stands. And people, the, the most reliable um, strategy for fencing is eight foot high woven wire fence, but obviously that's quite expensive. Um, and so some people have had limited success with plastic deer fencing. The size of the opening, you're paying attention to deer paths through the landscape um, and understanding that a commitment to fencing is a commitment to maintaining the fence, that both of those things um, are expenses you need to plan for, but they can be very, very effective. It's also a good idea if you're going to get in the business of managing deer density and deer impact that you do some kind of formal monitoring. And this can be part of your relationship with hunters as well. So 
pellet group counts, inviting hunters to come onto your land to do pellet group counts in the spring and simultaneously look at the browsing pressure on key species. And Tim Pearson and Dave D. Colesta, Tim's with Penn State Extension, have developed some really nice training tools for um, a method to do this. And I think we posted a tally sheet. Um, I see that one of the questioners is asking about slash piles from logging, and that's obviously critically important. In a, in a moderate situation, retaining a high proportion of the, of the slash on site, even to the point of foregoing any available pulpwood markets, since those are often marginal economically, um, those can be really important tools uh, in a group selection context, for example, keeping the loggers out of the group openings by asking them to actually tumble slash into the opening. Those are important natural barriers for deer access to seedlings. They don't work at high or very high deer densities, but they can make the difference in a moderate situation. So those are ideas about managing deer density. What about managing habitat quality to influence deer impact? Um, one of the things you need to think about is that the home range of a deer, at least in this area, is about a square mile or 640 acres. And so if your piece of the landscape is a lot smaller than that, you may have to pay attention to what others are doing and seize the moment when your next door neighbor is doing a harvest. That might be a good time for you to do it too. But if you have a larger tract that you're managing, then you can actually do some pretty purposeful things to manage habitat quality. So for example, um, here are some specific ideas. You can plan thinnings around your regeneration harvests and ask the contractor to complete the thinnings first. The purpose of the thinning is not regeneration, so it's okay, it should be OK with you, since regeneration is relatively far off, if the forage stimulated by the thinning is eaten up by deer. And that will allow, perhaps, the regeneration in the final removal cut to um, get away from the deer. Again, these tools are more effective at moderate or just sneaking up into the high level. And then this whole idea of moving your air, your practices, concentrating them in about a deer home range size, and then moving on to the next area of that size. Um, and then obviously, s people have had pretty effective um, success with food plots as well. And so the other thing, I mean, that we learned completely inadvertently in the enclosure study was that if you move yourself towards um, actually creating balanced age classes on your property, that should actually help manage deer impact as well. There are some caveats about relying too heavily on the habitat quality side of the deer impact equation. You really need to pay attention to um, what your under existing understory is. If you're in a legacy situation where your whole landscape is covered by ferns and the only place you treat them is in your final harvest areas, then you're not going to produce much for forage in your partial cuts because of the legacy effects that we've talked about. And so be sensitive to whether you're really going to increase forage on the basis of legacy and, and other effects as well. The other thing to be sensitive to when you're managing the habitat quality side of the deer impact equation is that without increased hunting, deer recruitment will increase sharply in improved habitat and deer impact will quickly rebound. So you need to balance this with continuing to monitor and involve hunting. Um, there's nothing that we can do silviculturally that's as effective at managing deer abundance for managing deer impact. So we come to the end, right? We've really taken a whole hour to get through our slides, but that's what happens when you ask people who've been working on a subject for 80 years. Um, deer and forests have clearly co-evolved, and it is possible to manage to sustain both on the landscape, but doing so requires monitoring and managing their complex interactions. So some conclusions. Um, if we think back to the things that 
Alex talked about, we certainly have a, a whole array of observational and experimental approaches that repeatedly demonstrate that deer overbrowsing creates and leaves a legacy of altered plant diversity. Overbrowsing has facilitated the establishment of dense understory vegetation layers which then have their own effects that persist even after deer density comes down. So certainly for those of you who have the luxury of operating someplace that doesn't have a history of deer overabundance, the ecological importance of preventing overabundance from developing cannot be overstated. It is a much easier problem to prevent than it is to correct. And finally, where overbrowsing legacies are pronounced, maintaining or promoting diversity will be highly challenging without additional active intervention to correct the legacy effects. So um, I don't, I, I'm hoping that Alex kept up with some of the questions in the chat space while I was talking and I tried to do that while Alex was talking, but it's a good time for those of you who are able to stay. Um, don't forget Peter's exit survey, but also um, let's have some questions. Okay, thank you, um, Susan and Alex. This was great. Um, and I'd like to I'll applaud you in having the record attendance so far in two and a half years of uh, webinars. Um, Susan mentioned my exit survey. I would uh, very sincerely hope that everyone who's participating, please click on that hot link in the top center of the screen. It'll open a, a, a site on your web browser and you can take that survey. We use this, I use this to provide feedback to the speakers and to document the impacts of this kind of program. So um, it's, it's critical that you do participate. Um, and as you're doing that, there are lots of questions Lots of uh, kudos going to Susan and Alex. Did a great job. Great slides. Um, and we'll take this time. We have um, as much time as Susan and Alex have. If there are questions that people want to uh, to put forward, they can do that. There were there was a high level of interaction during the presentation, so some of those questions have already been handled. I'll ask a question of Alex and Susan. You mentioned incentives for hunters in your uh, deer management area, and I don't recall the name of it, but incentives. What kinds of incentives did you use to encourage hunters to shoot more deer? Well, um, among the th this is something that's easier to do on a large cooperative, and we actually had a grant as well. So among the things that we do are a thank you banquet every fall with a, a not a lottery a like a drawing yeah okay. um, and uh, not everybody can do that but but honestly on a small property I think an annual thank you note is well within the range of reason um, and you, you know maybe having folks over for dinner again on a small property it doesn't have to be a banquet but I also think sharing information um, maps so people have confidence that they can get around sharing with people information about where you know the hot spots of deer impact are because those may be places where um, they'll be they'll have increased hunting success um, so I know that some states have programs where landowners who may be hesitant to open their ground to public hunting can be partnered up with individual people whom they can get to know. So I, I think once you sort of get that mindset of these people are providing a tremendously valuable service, you can begin to think of ways to thank them. I, Lots of people hunt in part because they love to spend time in the woods. And so I could imagine, we certainly do this on the Kinzu Quality Deer Cooperative, that having um, a spring pellet group 
count where you invite the hunters to participate or a late summer daylight survey where people drive a certain route and count deer and report all that information if you're willing to process that and share it just giving people these opportunities to be involved in the landscape at multiple times of year can be an incentive i, I liked the idea of a, of a hunter um labor force for doing pellet surveys that would i mean it seems like it would be a nice networking opportunity for the hunters and would also allow them to get out and and see where the deer are and and you could you know develop some nice gis maps that would show um you know uh, index levels of of deer density over time so that i could see that being a really powerful tool so okay i've uh i see that jerry has a question he's just typed in and uh, Susan and Alex, can you see that about the question about the ferns? Yeah, I see the the fern question there. So how can we manage these intrusive ferns, these hastened fern, New York fern, etc.? Um, unfortunately, uh, we really only know of one way that if to effectively treat these ferns, and that's uh, using herbicide applications, uh, glyphosate in mixes with. Uh, with other stuff, um, we there's work out there using fire as a management tool. But uh, again, like I mentioned, these hay-scented ferns and New York ferns are rhizomatous. They have these these pretty stout underground stems, and so you could run a fire through a stand, but the fern just uh, just reemerges or resprouts from dormant buds. There's been some work on on mowing the fern fields down or weed whacking them. Again, because of these. Uh, below ground buds they seem to re-sprout so if you have the time and energy I believe there's a paper out there that reports that that repeated mowing uh, events can actually knock it back because they never have an opportunity to to um, photosynthesize effectively and store that photosynthate those those carbohydrates so if you can do that I, that seems to work over time and we see uh, we see that sort of happening when we have successive frosts in fact it happened this year in parts of northwestern PA we had two late frosts they killed the existing fronds that had begun to emerge they started to emerge again and the second frost knocked those back as well and so frond densities in some areas were were less than they were last year um, but again, the only effective, uh, uh, reliable way is herbicide application. I see a question about effectiveness and accuracy of reporting of deer kills, and I know that's a highly controversial subject. Um, it's one of the benefits, really, of thinking of deer impact versus deer density. Um, and Probably also, I know in, I think all of New York, I know much of New York, there are these citizens' councils that help um, the agency decide whether their uh, antlerless tag allocations should be headed up or headed down based on the results that these committees bring to the table. And so if you're in an area where your observations of deer impact are poorly matched to the tags available in your area, it's probably time for you to get involved in a citizen's deer management council. Um, and I suspect that your extension agent can help you figure out how to do that. Studies regarding deer overbrows and invasive plant species pro proliferation, they're emerging. I know of people that are looking at it. I can't think of a publication off the top of my head. There's some work by Velland um, and some of his graduate students on that. There may be work also by Sue Kalis on that topic. Um, that's, you know, that's what I know at this point. There was also a question about a deer impact list serve. So I just put in the chat box a link to the www.deerandforest.org, which is like a it's not really a list serve, but it's a resource yeah, site. A clearinghouse of information, if you will. Uh, there was a question on, uh, what was it? Timing of spraying herbicide for fern control. Uh, we have a whole set of studies to address this. This was a question by Colleen. Um, I can send you those specific papers if you want. Um, you can contact me via email, but 
but the short answer is spraying at the late summer early fall when these ferns are beginning to senesce is, is the, ti the best time where you can apply the least amount of, of product of chemical and achieve as great if not greater kill on the ferns as if you would earlier in the season so late summer early fall so um, we forgot to put a slide up We forgot to put a slide up that um, would provide our email addresses, and so I'm going to put that in the chat box, too. Um, so when Alex says, contact me and I'll send you the publications, now you know how, and you can also contact me. And between one or the other of us, we'll get you whatever you're looking for. Well, I didn't know Bill McShay had done um, invasive research with deer. He's he's with Indiana DNR now? Oh, that's very cool. Okay. Uh, Mike Powell asks, has anyone seen a decrease in ferns and other undesirable species in exclosures? And the answer is absolutely. Um, Alex actually has a study now um, where he's looking at whether, for example, raspberries, which we think, rubus species in general, which we think are probably, at least locally, the natural control on ferns on disturbed sites, um, can grow through fern and shade them out where deer densities are low, and whether we could actually provide some recommendations about that. But people, especially with the Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry, have been seeing exactly what you're talking about inside um, fences and been actually using that as a management technique for a time. I saw there was a, a question more about um, logistics from AT questions will the links to the reports be available again there's two ways that those are available I'm assuming the question about links is the links that were pasted into the chat pod one way is when we post this webinar the archive of it you will be able from the archive to uh, connect with any of the uh, hot links that were put into the chat pod. That's why we've been using the chat pod to share those hot links. Uh, a second way is that we have just started on the Forest Connect website a forum, and I will um, I'll collect the or have a student collect the hot links and post those onto that forum. The website for that forum is uh, forestconnect.info. Typing, so I can't think and type. Forestconnect.info.forum, and I'll try and get those those reports posted there within the next week, so that you don't have to um, scroll back through the the archive. So that's the two places. There is a second part question from AT. Uh, confirmation of the credits for this session. If you completed the um, the continuing education credit survey that was offered at the beginning, then I send everyone who completed that an email notice uh, confirming your participation. And that email you can print and provide to your credentialing organization. I see that Mitch asked, is there a certain distance a food um, plot should or shouldn't be from seedlings? And I don't know the answer to that question, but I saw in the very early chatter that there are some people on from the Quality Deer Management Association, and my guess is that they have very good information about that. So if either that person wants to post something in the chat space or you could go to the QDMA. Uh, I think it's both org and com website and look f for information about food plots. Okay, well, um, Alex and Susan, it looks like the questions have, um, have uh, waned. We still are holding very strong with 75 people, but I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you both for a wonderful presentation. This was um, superbly done. It worked really well to have uh, both of you kind of tag teaming and uh, being able to provide uh, chat box response or chat pod response at the same time that, uh, that the other one of you was presenting. So 
that's a we've never done that and that worked great and that's a, a nice new addition to the strategies so um thank you all i will uh for those i was gonna say for the for those of you that want to see this again you can come back at 7 p.m tonight uh, shortly after it started, there were half a dozen people that emailed me and said they couldn't get in, so I know that there was even more demand than what we could support. But uh, my thanks to you all, and especially to Alex and Susan for their work in putting this presentation together. So with this, we will officially close, and I wish you all a good afternoon, and we'll have uh, Susan, I guess, back tonight to give the presentation uh, the second time. So Alex, thanks to you. Hope you have a good visit with your family. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.